Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hannah Berenson, and I am a graduate student in the Department of Human Development and Family Sciences. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ernestina Coast. Dr. Coast is a professor of health and international development in the Department of International Development at the London School of Economics. Her multidisciplinary research is within the intersection of health, gender, and development. Dr. Coast uses her training in demography and anthropology to answer the interrelationships between social context and health-related behaviors. In particular, her mixed methods work focuses on sexual and reproductive health. Dr. Coast has acted as advisor to a number of organizations, including the United Kingdom's Department for International Development and the United Nations Program on HIV and AIDS. In addition, Dr. Coast has served as a member of the WHO Guideline Development Group for Maternal and Newborn Health. She has also been a visiting scholar at the African Population and Health Research Center and is currently a board member of the Guttmacher Institute. Today, Dr. Coast will be presenting her talk, Adolescence, Contraception, and Abortion-Related Care, a Comparative Study of Ethiopia, Malawi, and Zambia. So everyone, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Ernestina Coast. Thank you, Hannah. Um, that was that was brilliant, if not always a little uncomfortable when you hear yourself being talked about, uh, but very nicely done. Um, thank you. Well, thank you uh, for the for the invite uh, to to present. When I say my work, um, you're going to see, you know, none of this work happens uh, in isolation. It's not just one academic sat in a mythical uh, tower doing this sort of work. Um, but thanks for inviting me uh, to talk about this work. Um, let me just check in because now I'm working across two screens and for me to look at people I have to look away from my camera. Um, do you do questions at the end, questions during? I mean I really am easy in terms of how this how this goes. I'm just not going to be able to see any questions put into chat while I'm presenting. We usually save the questions for the end okay. so we'll, um, uh, we'll open up the floor afterwards okay, sure. uh, but if anything comes through in the chat I will uh, brilliant when I, when I stop screen sharing I can, I can look at the chat uh, then I can multitask but at the moment I can't I can't see the chat okay um, without further ado what I'd really like to do is literally just take a couple of minutes and you've kind of had some hints there in uh, Hannah's introduction of me um, because I think it's useful for me, and I think it's useful uh, for an audience to hear a little bit about kind of where research comes from intellectually. Um, I've talked about it as, as an evolution um, on these slides uh, because it, it doesn't just happen. Uh, it comes out of a whole confluence of things um, coming together. So uh, forgiving my appalling skills as a graphic designer, uh, these are some of the sort of headlines uh, that I just quickly uh, want to talk through. Uh, the first one of which is disciplinary background. And I've got training in demography, I've got training in anthropology, um, I've been working at the London School of, Econ of Economics for a while. I am not an economist, which is normally the first thing I have to tell anybody when I say I work at the LSC. Um, I've worked in a department of policy and I'm in a department now of international development. And I find that really productive and creative, thinking about how do we bring different disciplinary approaches um, to bear on an issue, to bear on a problem. And this is something that for me started um, a while ago, started during my PhD, um, which actually <laughs> as a result of having to read so many ethnographies, um, I found myself thinking, okay, what is it that, because I was doing a PhD in anthropology, but I was doing a PhD on the demography um, of a particular ethnic group in East Africa. Um, what is it that demographers think about and what is it that they do with ethnographies? Um, so this was a piece that I'd never planned on writing, but was actually as a result of doing my all of my lit review and, and situating myself in the literature uh, as a PhD student that actually led to this, this piece critiquing uh, largely uh, what demographers and what some very esteemed demographers do and don't do um, with, uh, with ethnographies. Um, and then that led to thinking about this thing called, for a while, anthropological um, demography. 
stick with me. There's a purpose to why I'm talking about this stuff. So I was thinking about these things in demography, uh, these, these vital events. And one of the things that had always sort of stuck with me uh, was, you know, when you're doing things like the Bongots decomposition. And, you know, I remember being taught by very esteemed people, oh, when it's the index for abortion, uh, just give it a, a figure of one because nobody's got any data on abortion. And, you know, it's just messy for demography. And that sort of stuck with me um, and led me to thinking about abortion as a demographic concept um, and trying to look at it from different disciplinary perspectives, um, which led to a whole series of work in Zambia, which I got funding for, which was to look at trajectories. Don't worry, like I said, I'm not a graphic designer. I'm not expecting you to read this, rather just get a sense of how complicated it is when you start to unpack this thing that demographers, when I was trained as a demographer, uh, were saying, well, just, just say it's one, then it doesn't mess up the mess up the equations when you're thinking about the proximate determinants of fertility. And so this got me thinking about the very complex pathways and all of the factors that are brought to bear on an abortion trajectory. And I, I very deliberately selected to use the word trajectory in order to describe something that is non-linear, can reverse, can stall, can move forwards. And doing that piece of work and thinking about trajectories really got me in specifically in a project in Zambia, um, got me thinking and talking and lots of conversations uh, with people within and beyond the LSE about how we situate this thing called abortion, how we situ situate it both in time and place. And as a result of all of these conversations um, led to a piece of work uh, with Alison Norris at Ohio, uh, Anne Moore at Guttmacher, and uh, another colleague, Emily Freeman at the LSE, where we basically set ourselves the task of saying, okay, if you wanted to understand somebody's individual abortion trajectory, what are all of the things that you'd have to think about if you wanted to try and explain? Okay, so we did a really massive systematic scoping of, of the evidence. Um, situated explicitly within a socio-ecological model of looking at things at the micro, meso and macro um, level. And found this a really interesting process to go through, uh, not least because of the ways in which people then start to say, well, you know, that's just a lit review. It is just a lit review, but it helps us by doing that scoping of the literature to work out where are the gaps? What don't we know very much about? What do we know or who do we know a lot more about um, than others? Which has led to more recent work um, around thinking about framing, about how different lenses, different theoretical lenses to thinking about abortion um, helps us understand abortion. Um, so working with a colleague, we've looked at the issue of conscientious objection. What does it mean when somebody is denied a service or they're denied a referral for a service? Um, and also what does it mean when in a faith-based setting, um, the ways in which individual providers of care navigate their own personal faith to provide care? Um, a separate piece of work, uh, and here I am actually working with an economist, uh, with uh, Jana van der Mullen Rogers at Rutgers um, and other colleagues, and we are looking at, it's a very large project, um, working with people at IPAS, looking at the economics of abortion, but drawing upon this thinking of the micro, the meso and the macro, and then explicitly looking at the economics of abortion. And the one that's most recent um, is one on structural violence and abortion and thinking about how is it, or rather how and in what ways can we better analyze abortion situated in its context if we use a framing of structural 
violence. Um, and this actually came out of a throwaway conversation uh, with two, um, one postdoctoral and one PhD student of mine and uh, breaking news because we just got accepted today uh, for an article on COVID and its intersections with structural violence and abortion. So I'm going to finish up with me because I also think it's really important and it's something that I'm grappling with all of the time about what it means for me as a white British cisgender woman to be working and thinking about abortion specifically in this presentation here um, of adolescents in three countries uh, Ethiopia, Malawi and Zambia and thinking about the power dynamics and what that means for me, how I behave as a PI. Should I be PI on a piece of work like this? So these are very, very much sort of live conversations situated broadly under the umbrella of thinking about the decolonization um, of global health. So I really hope that that sort of quick trip through, you know, my evolution uh, is useful. Um, to help situate a particular piece of work um, around looking in comparative uh, research design, uh, contraception and abortion related care of adolescents in these three countries, um, Ethiopia, Malawi and Zambia. But like I said, you know, you don't do a piece of work like this alone. Um, uh, this is the name, sorry, these are the names of the people on the team across five countries involved in this piece of work. So let's set the scene. Why bother? Why look at issues of adolescence and abortion? Well, the, these are the headlines, okay? This is, this is what the literature has already established. Um, not necessarily in these three countries, but this is what the body of evidence shows us. We know that adolescents are more likely to have an unsafe abortion and to experience complications. We know they are much less likely to be able to access a safe abortion compared to women aged 20 and above. And that's because of a confluence of all sorts of reasons. And I also think it's important for me to flag here that I'm using the binary of safe and unsafe abortion. Um, and I'm using that as a shorthand, but it is much more complex than simply dividing into safe and unsafe. And this has been recognized in, in lots of work um, because it's much more about a continuum of safety. Um, in other words, somebody who is self-using or self-managing an abortion using um, medication, abortion, with support maybe over the internet or by telemedicine is a very less, sorry, I was about to give myself a triple negative there, so I'll start that sentence again, is a much less unsafe form of abortion than somebody uh, who is having a foreign object inserted by a traditional healer, for example. So I'm using safe and unsafe abortion as a shorthand, but it's a continuum of safety. And I think that's, that's really important to remember. So why did we pick these three countries? Well, they were picked deliberately and purposively to represent three different points on a continuum in terms of the macro context. And here in terms of the macro context, talking about the legal context and the, the service and the policy context. So on the one hand, we have Ethiopia, where relatively recently, um, certainly within the last two decades, uh, the law liberalized substantially, not only to provide safe legal abortion under a wide range of grounds, but also, and really importantly, for adolescents aged below 18 to provide abortion without having to name any of these grounds. And that's a really important point in terms of thinking about the three, sorry, the three points along the continuum. Ethiopian government has made great strides in making safe abortion widely available uh, in the public sector, 
but there's also substantial regulated private and NGO sector provision. In Zambia, by contrast, despite having it's called the Termination of Pregnancy Bill, uh, which has been on the statute books uh, for more than 40 years. Um, so the legal macro frameworks are in place, but service provision is very patchy in the public sector. There is some availability, some regulated availability in the private um, and NGO sector. And then there are all sorts of barriers. For example, unless it's an emergency, um, a legal abortion requires the signature of three um, doctors, one of whom must be a specialist, which means an OBGYN. And then in terms of the least, that would be Malawi, uh, where the law currently, although there has been a bill stalled uh, for a couple of years now, um, but currently it's legal only to save uh, the life of the woman. And there is exceptionally limited availability in NGO franchises of abortion services. So that's why these three countries deliberately selected across a continuum of the macro context. So I'm going to speak very briefly about our research methods. Um, we did interviews with adolescents aged 10 to 19 who had sought either safe abortion, that's what SA stands for, or post-abortion care for an induced abortion in public facilities, about 100 in each country. Um, in those interviews, we simultaneously collected quantitative and qualitative evidence, uh, and we used a technique that I had used previously in the work in Zambia on trajectories, which is to have two interviewers in an interview. I'm not going to go into detail about that, but I'm happy to answer questions about how that works in reality. We also did stakeholder interviews. We've done comparative policy and legal policy analyses and some comparative cost modeling, which is being led by Dr. Tiziana Leone, who I'm pretty sure presented to this PRC fairly recently uh, on another piece of work that we're working on together, but is led by Tiziana. Um, all of our research materials and instruments are available. Uh, we want them to be used, reused, uh, adapted, so they're all available on our project website. But one little thing that I do want to point out, because we were very aware of the fact that particularly but not only in contexts where abortion is illegal, so particularly Malawi, um, although it's a technique we used in all three countries, combined with the fact that we were asking adolescents to talk about abortion related care, highly stigmatized, may or may not have been illegal, um, that we needed to think about ways of eliciting responses to understand what it was that girls had actually done. So we went for an approach uh, which hasn't been used before, super low tech, but co-produced with all of the research assistants, which was literally a flip chart book. So specific to each country, uh, co-produced with the research assistants, we did big brainstorming around what are all the things that anybody has ever heard of that are being used in this context um, to procure an abortion. And it worked really well. We were really pleasantly surprised because we can see in the transcripts and we've got interviews where adolescents, being adolescents, go silent, as is their right in an interview. But from the annotations from the interviewers, where they have written uh, a note saying she pointed to this picture and she nodded. We were eliciting lots of information around all sorts of methods. Remember how at the beginning I talked about the continuum of safety? All sorts of methods, including the use of medication abortion outside the regulated sector, because we uh, were able to get photographs from pharmacies um, of all of the different packaging for mesoprostol and mifepristone, for example, in, in each country. And I've just done a tiny excerpt here uh, from one of our transcripts uh, where we can see how being able to point 
at the flip chart and pointed a picture actually gave us a lot of information. And then it allowed the research assistants uh, to really ask probing questions about what somebody had done and then lots of follow on questions uh, who'd helped them. How did they know about this? How did they find out about it? So our findings so far, and these are very preliminary. I think it's really important that we start with the words of adolescence. We don't actually hear a lot about what adolescents think about having had an abortion or in self-care done an abortion. And we saw or heard, sorry, a lot of relief, a lot of thinking about pretty soon after the the end of their care, because that's when we interviewed them at the point of discharge, um, is thinking about now I can get on with my life. Um, now I can think about my plans for education. And that was a really common theme. So what's the headline? Now, remember what I said about the three different legal contexts. And in many ways, this infographic sums it up. In terms of the proportions who had a safe abortion, Ethiopia, 98%, almost the flip reverse in Malawi, 4%. So we can see very clearly the ways in which the macro structure, and I was talking before about the ways in which the legal context can form part of the institutions that cause structural violence, then we can see this very, very clearly if we just compare Ethiopia and Malawi. And Zambia is a really interesting case because it's got the legal instruments, but they're not backed up in terms of people knowing about the law, either in terms of the general population or in terms of health care workers knowing about the law or providing the services. So I, I'm going to show you like the neat and tidy headline result and then I'm going to show you how it gets uh, messier and messier. So this is just a table summarizing that again but giving a little bit more nuance and showing us that in Zambia uh, we were also interviewing adolescents who had had a legal abortion elsewhere but then because of issues with affording that care they would then end up in the public sector. Right for the next slide just remember, we are not graphic designers on this project. What I want you to do is to focus on, we've got three countries here. Ethiopia is yellow, Malawi is red, Zambia is green. And what we are trying to do is to track by doing things proportionate to the numbers that went different routes before they got to the health facility where we interviewed them. And the headline there is that in Ethiopia, which is yellow, we see substantial proportions able to go directly to a health facility. Compare that to Zambia, which is green, the green country here, which also has similar legal grounds. And look how much more complicated it is in Zambia. Compare that to Malawi, where a very small proportion um, went directly or were able to go directly to a health facility. So what we're not seeing in a graphic like that are all of the delays. And one of the points about abortion care seeking is the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking very fast, particularly, for example, if you're an adolescent who is at boarding school, at state boarding school, and realizes that she's pregnant and is thinking about how am I going to seek abortion related care when I'm in boarding school and I need to work out how I can get home, maybe for the school holidays, and then start seeking care. So we see, I'm just giving that as one illustration. But critically, delays are really important because they really affect the type of care that's possible, and they also affect the health outcomes. Now, in this graph, Ethiopia is blue. And if you look at the right hand side, the did not know where to go as being the main reason uh, for, for the delay. Even in Ethiopia, with all of the services and all of the legal framing, substantial proportions of adolescents had substantial delays because they just didn't know where to go. Headline story in terms of the reasons uh, for seeking an abortion across all three countries, uh, but there were substantial variations, is to do with education. But it's not just as simple as 
I don't want to drop out of school or I want to continue my education. In our qualitative analyses, there were lots of nuances around being really concerned about disappointing families, disappointing families who had invested maybe in school fees uh, or maybe in terms of resources for education. Um, so the headline was that education as a reason uh, for having abortion, but it was much more nuanced than simply not wanting to have to drop out of school. In Malawi, for example, we saw a lot of narratives um, around it would mean having to leave school because it would mean having to get married um, or having to cohabit with the father of the pregnancy. We saw particularly in Ethiopia and in all three countries, our study sites uh, were in the capital city. Sorry, I should have said that at the beginning. This is very much an urban study. Um, we saw particularly in Addis Ababa, the issue of girls who had migrated from rural to urban areas uh, seeking domestic work. Um, we saw how employment based sexual exploitation, sexual violence and rape um, were a, a driver of the unplanned pregnancy. And we also see poverty um, coming coming through as a as a driver for seeking an abortion. I'm often hesitant to put up a graph like this because it tells you the headline, but it is losing so much of the nuance in terms of the narratives um, for adolescents seeking an abortion. One area that we see so rarely talked about in the literature, bearing in mind that for abortion related Claire, Claire, sorry, abortion related care, the clock starts ticking. The question is, well, when does the clock start ticking? The issues around adolescents, particularly if we're talking about adolescents who have never been pregnant before and or didn't think they could get pregnant because it was the first time they had sex, are critically uh, important. But actually, there's very little literature and evidence out there that really disentangles uh, the issues around knowing that you're pregnant or maybe being suspicious that you're pregnant, but hoping it's going to go away or sticking your head in the sand and hoping the problem's going to go away, which is a pretty universal response of adolescents the world over, not only in these three countries, it's also true in the UK, um, of adolescents hoping that the fact that they've missed their period is, is not an issue and it will be okay. Um, what we see are some, use some substantial use depending on country of pregnancy tests to actually confirm a pregnancy but I think unpacking the almost the continuum from suspicions that I might be pregnant to I'm pretty sure I am pregnant because I'm throwing up every morning through to actually having a test to confirm is in and of itself a trajectory for adolescents um, some adolescents who had more resources and knew and were able to overcome the stigma of going for a pregnancy test were able to do that quite quickly because seeking a pregnancy test in and of itself reveals stigmatized behavior, which is being pregnant as a result of sex before marriage. So even the act of seeking a pregnancy test is highly or can be highly stigmatized. And we saw all sorts of strategies being deployed by adolescents in order to get a pregnancy test, including if they were able to disclose to somebody else, maybe an older female relative, that person going to buy the test and, and bringing it back for them, for example. We've got lots and lots of uh, qualitative and a lot more quantitative evidence um, around whether or not they had ever used contraception and additionally if they had ever used contraception uh, whether or not they were using it at the time when they became pregnant for the pregnancy that has just ended. And what we see here are the headline messages in terms of method mix is where contraception is being reported it's male condom use we see coming through very strongly, which is why you've got the gap between the blue bar and the orange bar, highly inconsistent use of male condoms and just how low girls' autonomy is in terms of the control over their bodies. 
one of the most consistent narratives was starting to have sex in a um, train of thought. So high levels of inconsistent use, substantial proportions of uh, method failure, um, because, for example, in Ethiopia, upwards of 20% uh, reported that they were using uh, a form of con contraception um, at the time. Um, emergency contraception, again, it really doesn't get the level of uh, focus and attention that it, that it ought to do. Um, so what you're looking at here is we asked lots of questions around whether or not they'd ever heard of emergency contraception. Uh, so across all countries, uh, less than half had ever heard of it. Um, of those that had ever heard of it, we asked whether or not they'd ever used it. Um, very, no, no ever use in, in Malawi, uh, very low use in, in Zambia, slightly higher in Ethiopia. Uh, and we also asked a lot of kind of probing questions around whether or not they'd used it at the time of this pregnancy. Uh, we got some reports um, of that, but clearly um, had not used it um, effectively or taken it at the correct time. Uh, because all of these responses were from people who had subsequently had um, an abortion. Um, so despite uh, Ethiopia's legal uh, and policy setting, uh, we saw lots of cases where despite the laws and policies supporting the autonomous choice of legal abortion, uh, at no charge importantly for, for legal minors, um, that was not uh, always happening. We saw um, in this excerpt from a transcript, um, somebody being turned away um, and actually just just not returning to that service provider because they were told um, to get consent from a parent. Uh, we see also coercive care uh, because there's a lot of policy and uh, service emphasis on post-abortion uh, family planning, um, consensual post-abortion uh, family planning. Uh, but this is an excerpt from a transcript um, of and this, this is certainly not the only case um, of an adolescent providing, sorry, providing evidence of coercive care. Uh, and in this case, an adolescent who thought that she had to say yes to post-abortion uh, family planning uh, if she wanted to, to get the abortion. And she, she was pretty clear that she was, she was not happy uh, with this. We hear a lot about choice. Uh, around contraception. And these are excerpts from, from all three countries uh, where it was very clear. And this is where, you know, we've got issues around, well, is this choice or coercion? Um, but we certainly see an absence of choice being offered and possibly most starkly in the final one. Um, I don't want it. A nurse told me that I have to use contraception for the first time when I registered at the place where we did the interviews and told me for the second time when I was on the ward. But I said to her that I don't want it. She couldn't understand me. She considered me as a rude girl and treated me badly. So we start to see here all sorts of issues around disrespectful care, around an absence of choice um, in terms of girls' experiences. Um, and I think we need to be mindful of this particularly, but not only when we're seeing the levels of uh, sexual violence um, being reported uh, by girls as a cause of the unplanned pregnancy. Uh, we see refusal or denial of care or, or referral because, for example, in Zambia, there is provision for conscientious objection to providing care, but not to providing a referral to somebody who will provide care. And that's a really important um, point. Uh, so I'll read out the excerpt from Zambia. Uh, the doctor refused, saying that he cannot give me the medicine, saying that he cannot give me because what I want to do is wrong, that I should just keep my pregnancy. Then he said he cannot give me the medicine because it is more like he is encouraging me to go ahead with what I want to do. And I think when we're thinking about safe and unsafe abortions, uh, when girls have tried and been turned away from safe abortion provision, uh, they will often end up um, seeking unsafe care, unsurprisingly. We see things like unofficial fees. Remember, all of our recruitment was in the, in the public sector uh, where care was meant to be provided uh, for free. Um, 
hugely high levels but remember we're talking about adolescents and an awful lot of adolescents don't actually know particularly uh, if someone older has accompanied them for care they often don't know uh, what has been paid uh, we see it in terms of safe abortion care we also see it in malawi in terms of post-abortion care in other words if you pay some money you'll get treated uh, faster for example and i think this case and it struck all of us on the team. Uh, we've done a lot of team coding of our qualitative evidence um, of an adolescent saying, you know, it shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't be like this. Weren't nurses trained? Weren't they told that they were going to be treating? Uh, weren't nurses and doctors, sorry, told they'd be treating um, people of our age? And, you know, this is really stark. This adolescent finished by saying, I told my aunt, I don't want to receive the medication. Better I go die from home and then you come and bring me here as a dead body. Um, really giving voice to her experience of receiving disrespectful care. I talked at the beginning about how in terms of the evolution of my work, um, you know, it's really about looking at how people experience not only abortion related care, but that's what I'm focusing on here right now, uh, but how that's situated in its macro context. How is it situated in its legal context and its policy analysis? So one of our team members, Dr. Kangoide, who has um, a legal background and training, um, has done some really fine grained analysis comparatively um, of looking at what laws and policies say because we're hearing in the interviews what actually happens for adolescents, but then we're looking at the other end of the telescope and we're looking at what do the laws and policies say. And really what we see, and we see it coming out in girls' uh, interviews, uh, but we also see it through, through uh, Godfrey's analyses, that laws and policies tend to be interpreted in ways that uh, reflect social norms about adolescent sexuality and sometimes in ways that are at odds with what the laws and policies say, particularly in Ethiopia and Zambia, uh, where there are uh, far more enabling laws and policies than Malawi. If anybody's interested in this work, it's just recently uh, been, been published. We also did a lot of key informant uh, interviews and I think this key informant uh, really sort of summed it up, uh, which is, you know, sometimes we just do the policies on paper so that globally on paper, we are one of the most forward countries, but on the ground, and they kind of just went and sort of shrugged. We've worked quite a lot in terms of thinking about how do we communicate our evidence. So if anybody's interested, we've done a whole series of policy briefs alongside doing our academic uh, paper writing. Um, in terms of how do we communicate the findings in ways that are meaningful in individual policy contexts. And something that was profoundly important to us, but we didn't get funding for when we originally uh, set up this, this project, was how do we communicate our findings in ways that are meaningful um, for adolescents. Uh, so we got some additional funding for knowledge exchange impact, it's called here in the UK, uh, and worked with a collective of, of artists and animators and uh, voiceover artists, uh, positive negatives, and now have a whole series of stories which are grounded in our transcripts. So using all of those narratives that came from the research interviews uh, for three stories, um, one in Ethiopia, one in Malawi, and, and one in, in Zambia, in English and in a variety of other languages, um, a series of uh, animations and comics and, and zines uh, communicating the findings of our research. Um, I'll stop there. I hope that was the sort of content uh, that you were expecting. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see people um, again, and then I'd be delighted um, that you've got questions. I'd be delighted if you just have questions. This is great. Thank you so much for a very interesting talk. And I'm sorry for the 
you know, the, um, the, 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 you got disconnected, but this is so interesting that everybody, you know, we were all able to jump right in. So um, let's open the floor for questions. It's a tradition of our pop center also to have uh, graduate students take their, the first, you know, uh, um, question. So there you go. Yeah, is it okay if I ask a question? Um, yeah, go ahead, my, uh, Veronica. Go, go, go. Yeah. Before my Wi-Fi cuts out as well, because I have unstable connection. Um, very briefly, I know you were focusing on the abortion side of things, but could you give us a sense about what access to con uh, contraceptive, uh, even emergency con contraceptive is in these countries? And is that, that signifies what's the education around that? Did that cut out in my presentation? Um, the stuff Maybe, I don't know if I picked it up. Okay, headline is really low for emergency contraception, exceptionally low in Malawi. But then when we started to look at service provision of emergency contraception, nobody should be surprised it's low because where is the place it's often kept? It's kept on the labor ward, on the maternity ward. Okay, so the idea that an adolescent is A, going to know that, and B, within 72 hours of having had uh, unprotected sex or contraceptive failure is going to make it onto a onto maternity delivery ward to find emergency contraception. Um, so for me, it's, it's a massive uh, piece that is really under-researched and under-reflected on and is actually a, an area that I want to devote more attention to looking at now. Um, more broadly, um, I can't cite the DHS figures for levels of contraceptive use ever used from, from DHS. Um, but what we're looking at in, in our work, maybe it cut out when I was presenting all the contraceptive data as well, did it? Did it cut out? Did you get any of the contraceptive data presented? You did a little bit. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting a nod. Um, is we are seeing very small levels of contraceptive use that isn't the male condom. It is quite clear that the default option is the male condom and that the stigma of using or even thinking about using other forms of contraception was very, very high. For example, in Malawi, a very common narrative was, this is not for me because I haven't yet given birth. In many ways, it was even less to do with marital status and a lot more to do with this is only for people that have started childbearing. Um, that it was particularly strong in Malawi, but it was absolutely present in the other two countries. Um, so that there is a very big piece around how adolescents are able to access or know about um, contraception because the piece around concerns about side effects you know and side effects are real I think for far too long side side effects have been downplayed or not given credence in service provision um, you know they certainly played a very big part in this particularly concerns around infertility and concerns around future infertility were a major set of concerns to do with having a safe abortion Veronica, I'm not sure I've answered your question sufficiently. No, deeply. 100% you did. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the question. Dana, Dana. Hey, thank you so much for your talk. I had a couple of questions about the dissemination of findings and engagement mm -hmm. part. My first question is, how did you as a research team determine what findings you really wanted to include in briefs versus in the adolescent engagement part? And my second question is, did you do any adolescent policy engagement? With like Can I just U clarify, what do you mean by adolescent policy engagement? Did you make any targeted briefs or any strategy for engaging youth ah, in the policy making right. process? Okay, so in terms of the animations and the zines and the comics, they were absolutely developed with an eye to, and they were co-produced with uh, feedback from adolescents in each of the three countries. You know, this was absolutely not me sat in London doing this, working with teams, working with adolescents. Unfortunately, COVID hit, so uh, we were unable to do as much face-to-face -face feedback with adolescents. 
Um, but there was a lot more done, uh, an awful lot done by WhatsApp. I'm a huge fan of WhatsApp um, in terms of sort of feedback around these these sorts of things. In terms of the policy, the the the, the briefs. Sorry, Dana's either jumped around. Oh, you've moved around on my screen. Sorry. Um, in terms of the briefs, you know, all of the evidence is that a brief done like that is not going to have traction with adolescents. So if we look, if you take a look at any of the animations, you will see that we have kind of um, fact cards at points in the animation in the story uh, that are underpinned by the research rather than doing the, the kind of the one pager two sider, which is absolutely what policymakers are telling us that they want. Um, they want something that talks about what are the implications of the laws. Um, we know that because already we've we've had MPs, uh, members of parliament, um, using these these fact sheets. D Dana, I'm not sure I've answered your question fully. Please follow up. You did. I was wondering particularly what would resonate with adolescents in terms of having them involved in like the political process or thinking about how this would be involved in the process of like ownership over their public health and their communities, that kind of a thing. Okay, that's that's a really good question. Um, part of the issue is for adolescents to have the information about what the impacts are for people like them. So when we were doing the original Zambia project, which is where I really got into the trajectories work, um, there was it was a really interesting space because they did the first ever youth parliament. Uh, which was to have youth parliamentarians sitting in the Zambian parliament debating the motion should abortion be, I can't remember the exact word of the motion, uh, but should abortion be made more, not more easily, should it be more available in Zambia? Uh, but please don't quote me on what the wording of that bill was. You know, and that, that was a really interesting space because not only did you have um, students coming along and representing their constituencies sitting in the Zambian parliament, you also had representatives from, for example, the Medical Students Association. So the Medical Students Association for Choice, the, uh, the legal students coming along, uh, the junior lawyers coming along. And you know there were all these sorts of groupings there around um, Doctors for Choice, for example, or Lawyers for Choice. Um, so the, I, I think there are all sorts of sort of entry points and, and levers, but th those are just a couple of examples. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's fine. I've obviously stunned everyone else into silence. Uh, Michelle. <laughs> You're muted, Michelle. Wow, okay, thank you. Um, that was such a wonderful talk. I really appreciate all of the information and the context about the three settings. Um, I was curious, you sort of led off with um, doing the adolescent interviews with two interviewers and the value and thought behind that. And I wanted to hear more about your reasoning. And I was also curious to hear about some, like if there were, discussions and reasons for getting abortion or reasons for using contraception that centered around partners needs or partners wants to terminate a pregnancy. Um, and I may have missed those, but just wanted to see like what role or how prominent those answers were as well. Okay, yeah, so uh, the, the methodology piece um, and, and sort of watch this space because we're trying to get this published uh, methodologically because we want to sort of talk about this, but I do talk about it in publications coming out of the original Zambia piece. Um, so. A lot of people, when they hear this, this idea that you're gonna have an adolescent having an interview with, with two research assistants, I mean, immediately the sort of view is, oh my goodness, you know, they're ganging up on her. You know, that's going to feel coercive. It's going to feel pressurized. One of the reasons we tried it out in the original Zambia study, which was women of all ages, not only adolescents, was trying to work out ways of eliciting simultaneously quantitative and qualitative evidence of not turning this into a survey with a questionnaire with specific orders, but needing to get 
quite a lot of quantitative information. So the way in which we set it up is that you have two interviewers, one of whom is absolutely doing it in, in, in a conversational way. You know, they've got no bits of paper, there's no computer, no laptop, tablet in front of them. And they know pretty much everything that's on our data sheets. And we don't call it a questionnaire. We call it a data sheet and we do that for a reason because we are not interested in the order in which the questions are asked. Because one of the points about abortion narratives is they are not linear. I mean, they, they can be like a plate of spaghetti trying to unpack them about who did what, when, how, and to whom. So we kind of threw out question order and instead wanted to have all of the hallmarks of a qualitative interview that needed to extract <laughs> quantitative information. So you might be thinking, well, hang on, what's the point of the second person in the room? Well, the second person in the room is sat there with the data sheet. So it, as they're listening to the conversation, they're picking out all of the quant stuff that they need. But then when the conversation comes to an end with the first person, they were able then to say, could I just check? Could I clarify? So any kind of missing pieces of quant information could be picked up. Um, does, does that answer your question? And I hope any concerns about you know, the ethics uh, of having two research assistants and, and one adolescent in a room. Uh, but we listened very carefully to the recordings um, and colleagues on the project who could understand the languages, importantly, senior people who could understand the languages, because I couldn't if they weren't in English, um, very alert to picking up, you know, was this, was this sensing like a girl could be being coerced or, or ganged up on rather by, by the interviewers. And, and I, I'm going to be categorical that um, there were two occasions when we had concerns and that then led to us feeding back to the research assistants um, and having a kind of a debrief. Um, and it wasn't, let me be very clear, it was not in terms of coercing someone to give an answer, but in terms of um, it becoming then a three-way conversation of, and you could see what the research assistants were trying to do in terms of, you know, we're all girls here, we've all been there, you know, that sort of language, but it was two people and one person. So I hope that allays any concerns that, that were there about what that did. What I can say is it absolutely helps to minimize the respondent burden in terms of the amount of time. You're not asking people for a second follow-up qualitative interview. Um, and it's entirely possible to get high quality quantitative data without caring about question order. Um, yeah. Michelle, you had a second question and I've absolutely blanked on what it is, but I think my clock is a couple of minutes slow because I can see people leaving. Am I over time? Because I can't see my clock right now. So here's my, yes. Yeah, so here's my suggestion. Um, you know, feel free. Yes, it's one o'clock. So if you okay. need to leave, uh, please leave. Everybody, oh, wait. Letitia, are you all right? Yes, yeah, something fell here. Just a sec. <laughs> we are full well, of, uh, can you, Edwin, can you help me like with leading? Because yeah, if um, I if, just fell. Um, Dr. Coast, if you're okay with people staying on and asking you questions. Yeah, I can stay for a few um, minutes. You know, if people have got questions or follow ups. Uh, I know Michelle had two questions and I sort of managed to answer one and I've completely forgotten what the second one was. Um, I love it. This just feels like the most disaster prone. Uh, you know, I've lost internet. Letitia, Letitia is being crushed by her desk, The desktop, which is anyways, I have one of those raised. The desktop fell on me. So, but it's all You're okay. The... Are you okay? Yay. That's the most important point. Yeah. But if, um, if you want to stay on and ask questions, um, We'll, we'll leave the meeting open. Yeah, listen, I'm um, also perfectly so, happy if people want to follow up with email questions. Um, Michelle, if, you, if you're if you happy to stay and you want to repeat your second question, I'm quite happy to attempt to answer I'm it. I've honestly forgotten what No, that's okay. I was just going to say, if someone else has a question, I'd rather them ask and I can come back if not. So we're not holding the floor. <clears throat> no, I, th I think you're good. Okay. I'm not seeing any you're other. good. Then we'll take your question and then, yeah. And and there, how does that sound? Sure, that sounds good. Um, I was interested in like the role of the uh, partner and deciding uh, yes. to do yes, yeah, yeah. abortion and thinking about contraception as well. Yeah, so if we're talking about contraception, 
then it, it was stark, the lack of bodily autonomy that girls had and uh, the, the, the constraints to exercising agency. Um, that maybe a condom used the first few times. And, and this is why if you look at any of our animations, you will see this as a common theme, the sort of sense of, you know, if you love me, you know, you won't use one, uh, you won't get pregnant. You know, it was also stark, the lack of, for many adolescents, understanding of the biology of conception. Um, and, you know, when her partner would say to her, you can't get pregnant because, or, you know, I, I won't come inside you. It, it was, it was such a dominant thread. Um, so there was very strong male control over contraceptive use, non-use, how it was used. That mm -hmm. was very clear. Small proportion, and we are also interested in the small proportion of adolescents who were using contraception. You know, when we got reviewed for the funding for this, one of the reviews was like, why aren't you focusing on contraception too? They didn't, s so we had to go back to them and <laughs> basically say, by studying adolescents who've had an abortion for an unplanned slash unmistimed, whatever category of pregnancy you want to call it, we are by default studying contraception. We're studying a particular subset of adolescents, but we, we are studying contraception because it's part of the whole if you want to use the fancy language, the whole commodity chain here. Yeah. Um, so in terms of male, when you say partner involvement, I'm assuming that you're talking about sexual partner. Yeah. In abortion decision making, we see a variety of roles. We see male partners who were highly supportive, very proactive in getting the resources together, be that information, money, kind of intelligence about, you know, where do we go? Where's the safest place? Um, so we see a group of male partners like that. We see a group of male partners for whom it was just immediate, immediate denial of paternity. That, that was so common. And um, particularly for girls um, that the sent, well, in the UK, we'd call it ghosting. Uh, somebody who doesn't answer their phone um, who just blocks you on their phone. I, I don't know what language would be used in the US. In the UK, it's known as ghosting. Um, yeah, you know, that was a very, and girls literally finding themselves completely alone and trying to work out, could they disclose to anybody? You know, who could they risk disclosing to? Uh, because if they didn't know that abortion was a possibility, if they genuinely didn't know what to do. Because remember for adolescents, abortion or contraception care seeking is often the first time they've ever had to seek care without an adult involved. So before they've had malaria, their mum takes them to the clinic. They've had diarrhea, their auntie takes them to the clinic or takes them to the pharmacy. Contraception and abortion is the first time that they've literally had to navigate what is a really complex health system themselves. Um, so it's a really critical decision a, can they disclose to anybody? Is it safe enough to disclose to anybody? And B, who can they disclose to who's going to keep their secret? Um, so sometimes that was partners. A lot of times it was not partners. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and actually I've got a, uh, in fact, Joe Strong, who I mentioned doing the work with us on um, structural violence and abortion is working on looking at uh, men's involvement in contraception mm -hmm. and abortion procurement, uh, actually in Ghana. Um, some really interesting stuff coming out of that. This is absolutely amazing. I wanna say that of the entire series, this is the one that we had more people, you know, asking questions and engaged of the whole uh, semester. So we want to thank you again for um, talking to us for your presentation and also for your generosity in staying a little, little bit longer and talking, you know, engaging. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's a uh, better way to spend my early evening on a Friday. <laughs> right. <laughs> so <laughs>
<laughs> we're researchers we love we love talking about our research yep. so i mean especially for the graduate students i heard dr coast saying that you know it's fine to follow up with her over email later so take absolutely the opportunity, yeah you know and thank you once again no, thank you for the invite i'm yeah. just sorry for the uh the appalling internet connection living in the My birth what fell can I on say? top of me <laughs> I think I win this. <laughs> and thank you, Edwin, for all your tech support. Very yeah. cool, calm, collected, and unflappable tech support. Thank you, Edwin. Show you if, anyway, it's all here right. and it's felt. All right. Thank Have you. a great weekend. All right. Great, Thanks, everybody. Uh, Friday right. evening. And uh, uh, thank you so much.